everyone. Welcome to the 2021 International E-Conference on the Historical Jesus. Now, today's theme, with the exception of a couple of presentations, is all about a discussion on what's known as Jesus mythicism. My name is Dr. Darren Slade, and I'm the president of the Global Center for Religious Research, which is hosting this year's academic conference. And one of the great things about GCRR is that you're being joined by students and scholars and specialists from all over the world, right from the comfort and safety of your own home. I want to remind everybody that there is a downloadable PDF file that was created specially for you and this conference uh, by the Scholars Choice Organization. So four separate book publishers, including Baker Academic and SBL Press, have given each of you a special discount code up to 40% off to use on books related to the historical Jesus. So all you have to do is go back to the GCR our website, go back to the Historical Jesus event webpage and click on the Scholar's Choice logo that's near the top of that webpage. And you'll be able to download the PDF. And the last thing I want to talk about is the Global Center for Religious Research has established the most comprehensive international research group to study the causes, manifestations, and treatment options for those suffering from religious trauma. The GCRR has built a team of approximately 30 licensed psychiatrists, therapists, sociologists, uh, university researchers, religion scholars, and PhD candidates from all over the world, most of whom specialize in the field of trauma research. Uh, but we have a really big problem. See, in order for victims of religious trauma to receive help, we need to arrive at a place in our culture where religious trauma is accepted as a real mental health condition. And unfortunately, the academic study of religious trauma remains in its infancy when compared to other studies in mental health. That means there are no exhaustive empirical studies to support uh, what we've all experienced in the tens of thousands, that religious trauma exists and is a chronic problem in many religious traditions. So as it stands, really only anecdotal case studies have been published, but nothing substantially empirical. And GCRR intends to correct this gap of knowledge by offering an interdisciplinary and scientific examination of religious trauma. And we're hoping to get your help in supporting this project. We've set up a GoFundMe page in order to crowdsource the world's very first comprehensive sociological study on those traumatized by religion in order to help set Set the stage, the foundational data from which other researchers and counselors can build on in order to get people who suffer from trauma the help that they need. The reason we've set up a GoFundMe is because unfortunately all federal funding to uh, mental health research has come to a screeching halt and so that's why we've turned to the, to, uh, the public for help. All you have to do is go to GoFundMe.com and search the phrase religious trauma sociological study or you can click on the link that i'll put in the chat box here shortly and with all that said i would like to introduce to you my very good friend and our next presenter dr ken ken hansen <laughs> 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 um ken dr hansen is going to be talking about jesus socialism and judeotopia and uh, so Dr. Hansen is an associate professor in the University of Central Florida Judaic Studies program. He earned a PhD in Judaic Studies from the University of Texas in uh, Austin in 1991. He has since published five books, including Secrets from the Last Bible, Lost Bible, Bloodkin of Jesus, uh, and Judaism and Jesus that was co-authored with Zev Garber, who will also be presenting later today. He's also published a number of scholarly articles focusing on the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Judaism of late antiquity. His research was recently featured in the 2007 History Channel documentary, Banned from the Bible 2, which I absolutely loved that series and, it, series, and it was great seeing you on that. So with that said, Dr. Hansen, the floor is yours. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, from the University of Central Florida, Orlando, where I am the coordinator of the Judaic Studies program. A lot of people don't realize UCF, University of Central Florida, is the second largest university in the United States. We have well over 60,000 students now. Uh, I wish we had the largest Judaic Studies program in the United States. We are working on it. Uh, but in any case, 
Uh, there are several professors who teach Judaic studies. I'm coordinator of the whole program. And I teach everything Jewish from antiquity, Abraham, Isaac, et cetera, across thousands of years of Jewish life and culture and literature, all the way through the Holocaust years and of course the rise of the modern state of Israel. We must, of course, touch on the historical Jesus. Uh, though we are Judaic studies, the fact of, of Jesus, I don't want to say fact, but, the, but the, the way that Jesus has been interpreted, that fact, and as it has touched Jewish life across the millennia, is enormous, has enormous consequence for the Jewish people, especially in the, the sense of anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, uh, leading all the way, of course, to the pogroms and ultimately to Auschwitz. So we do have to touch on the, the historical Jesus, whether or not he was a historical character, that's irrelevant. Uh, of course, we don't teach religion uh, at a state university, but we certainly teach about it. Um, and to, to that extent, I've produced a fresh article here, uh, touching on, let's call it him, the historical Jesus, whether or not he was historical. Certainly we have texts and my point is to, to understand how the text has been presented and how we should get a sense of, of the gospel texts. So I'm going to charge into what I call Jesus, socialism, and Judeotopia, admittedly controversial. It is a truism that almost every brand of religionist, philosopher, and moral commentator not to mention political theorist, has attempted to lay claim to the person of Jesus of Nazareth, as if doing so lends unimpeachable stature to one's cause or perspective. As Thomas Jefferson wrote, rogueries, absurdities, and untruths were perpetrated upon the teachings of Jesus by a large band of dupes, unquote. As a result, it is arguably the case that much if not most of what is common knowledge with respect to the great Nazarene amounts to anachronistic stereotype. That commingled with religious doctrine and dogma leaves the serious scholar and researcher endeavoring to uncover even the slightest trace of the real man and his message unvarnished by two millennia of force fitting him into one mold or another. Moreover, when occasional voices from the religious left chime in, justifying everything from social welfare to woke egalitarianism to outright Marxism in the guise of liberation theology. One wonders whether looking at Jesus through the simple lens of the Judaism of his day, albeit filtered through the teachings of the rabbinic sages, might shine a more reliable light on an ancient proto-rabbi who was at his core a Galilean, an Israelite, and a piously observant Jew. It is fair to assert, given what we know or think we know about the historical Jesus, that he might have been at least somewhat sympathetic to what today might be thought of as socialism. I will argue, however, that faithful Torah observance, the kind to which the historical Jesus certainly adhered, does not a woke socialist make. The one thing we know with certainty about Jesus is that we know very little with certainty. That being the case, it is fair to ask why anyone would be inclined to turn history's most celebrated Galilean into a dedicated socialist or even a fellow traveler on Karl Marx's utopian journey. Most likely, such a perspective is justified due to Jesus' sensitivity as recorded in the Christian gospels to the poor and downtrodden in tandem with his unrelenting attacks on the rich. Jesus is said to have declared to a certain rich young ruler, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. He is also credited with declaring, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, Matthew 19, 24. Not a few contemporary exegetes gleefully rely on such passages to cast Jesus in the role of Robin Hood. 
Anne Rand, noted for her spite for a socialist Marxist theory, was also known to have despised Jesus, since in her words, quote, Jesus, or perhaps his interpreters, gave men a code of altruism. That is a code which told them that in order to save one's soul, one must love or help or live for others, unquote. In her mind, Jesus, as any good socialist, promoted the collective over the interests of the individual, or did he? Perhaps it was his interpreters who gave us this image. Perhaps Anne Rand, like the Marxist theorists she abhorred, was inclined to filter Jesus through John's gospel, which declares that Jesus came, quote, that the world, not isolated individuals, be saved, unquote. That, of course, is John, which paints Jesus as a self-denying Greco-Hellenistic philosopher. The synoptic gospels, by contrast, find room to, to depict Jesus, a Jesus who was fully a product of the Jewish world of the pre-Rabbinic sages. Certainly, Judaism in antiquity, as well as in the modern world, represents a collective, but it does not involve, as Anne Rand described Jesus' message, quote, the subordination of one's soul or ego to the wishes, desires, or needs of others, unquote. Judaism classically taught that one should love others as oneself. However, neither the Jesus of the synoptics nor the religion to which he belonged taught subordinating one's soul to anyone. Hillel summed it up, expressing the golden rule later attributed to Jesus in the negative, quote, that which is hateful to yourself, do not do to others, unquote. Obviously, the self should not and cannot be subordinated, for it is the measure by which others should or should not be treated. In a larger context, the Jewish collective historically celebrated individual contributions. And while Jews have never quibbled with the notion that it takes a village the Jewish village has historically been composed of individuals whose altruism leaves healthy self-interest undiminished. Indeed, a cursory overview of history finds legions of Jewish merchants, entrepreneurs, and capitalists of every variety. And even the rabbis and sages of late antiquity preferred to have a trade, earning their own living rather than subsisting from the contributions of others. Are we to conclude that, the G, that Jesus, the Jew, the son of a carpenter, was somehow different, even a social revolutionary of sorts? Che Guevara has been celebrated as a revolutionary life. Renowned Jesus scholar John Dominic Crossan summed up the great Galilean in one of his tomes titled Jesus, a Revolutionary Biography. Yet contrary to popular perceptions, Jesus' family was well enough off to afford pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which is hardly what we would expect from those who had hailed from an impoverished pastoral society. If the gospel narratives are to be trusted at all, this Jesus was not, in Crossan's words, a Mediterranean Jewish peasant or an exploited peasant with an attitude. Josephus attests that Galilee was a land of rich fertility, and very highly cultivated. He observes, quote, moreover, the cities lie here very thick and the very many villages are everywhere so full of people by the richness of the soil that the very least of them contain above 15,000 inhabitants, unquote. Arguably, the whole notion of a poverty-stricken population desperate for social revolution needs to be reconsidered. When it comes to what is fondly referred to as social justice, it is fair to point not only to the Torah, but to ancient Israel's prophetic class as the originators of the concept of equity and compassion for all people and special concern for those in need. Noted religious historian Karen Armstrong has argued that the Jewish society of this period spawned an egalitarian and socialist ethic. Socialist? Perhaps the religious left, Karen Armstrong included, needs reminding that caring for the poor and needy was something that this ancient society practiced not by governmental fiat, but as a religious obligation only. 
the amount of charity to be distributed was a matter of interpretation. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10 instructs the Israelites not to reap the corners of their fields or pick their vines bare, thereby leaving them for the poor. However, the size of the corners which remain unharvested and the number of grapes which should be left on the vines is not specified. Ancient Israel was not the Roman Empire, where the centralized state was the guarantor of both bread and circuses. For Jews, charity became synonymous with upright conduct on an individual level and was therefore called in Hebrew tzedakah, literally meaning righteousness. It became a tradition carried forth by Israel's great sages throughout Talmudic times and beyond. It should also be recognized that Judaism, except on rare occasions when the state itself was Jewish, as in David's ancient kingdom and the later Hasmonean dynasty, operated independently of the secular government, which in Jesus' day was a mere proxy of Rome. Unlike Islam, where charity was instituted as a tax, an obligation known as zakat paid to the religiously dominated state, in Judaism, charity was strongly recommended but never coerced. The best situation for Jews that for which Jews could hope was to be left alone by the state, not sublimated to a central government, governmental collective. The only option when the land was held captive to an occupying power was to throw off the foreign yoke, which was certainly an aspect of the geopolitical climate in which the historical Jesus found himself. Jesus, moreover, was wise enough to know, like his Pharisee counterparts, that charity, tzedakah, works best when it is distributed privately. It is in this cultural context that his remarks to the rich young ruler should be understood. Rabbinic literature does go into detail about tzedakah, citing various levels of giving, ranking them from lowest to highest. Though the source is medieval, it has much to say about Jewish attitudes going back to antiquity. The third highest level is when the donor is aware of the recipient's identity, but the recipient is unaware of the source. The second highest is when both donor and recipient are unknown to each other. The highest level of charity, however, is to help sustain someone before that individual becomes impoverished by helping the person find employment or some form of business so that dependence on others becomes unnecessary. Nowhere is what we might conceive as the welfare state referenced in any of this. In ancient Judea, King Herod the Great, himself a lackey of Rome, pretended to care for all elements of his ethnically diverse population, Israelites and non-Israelites as well all the while crushing his subjects under burdensome taxation and forced labor slash slavery. Those who were more well off, the so-called Herodians and their allies, including the Sadducees and their multiple priestly orders, governmental officials and the landed gentry thrived precisely because of their connections with the ruling authorities. In Anne Rand's world, the rich were the bloat-bellied bureaucrats of centralized government. In ancient Israel, under the Herodian dynasty, they were much the same. Given the socio-historical realities of his day, does Jesus still sound like a socialist slash Marxist? Who were the oppressed souls he represented? The Galilean fisherman selling his daily catch for as much hard coinage as he could earn? or the industrious craftsman, the carpenter, the tool maker, or the tanner involved in what amounted to cottage industries. These were the small businesses of the day engaged in by generations of what we might think of as early entrepreneurs, bourgeois elements capable of warming the cockles of Adam Smith's capitalist heart. Were those the ones Jesus chastised or was his castigation of the rich code language for a subversive broadside against Israel's version of big government autocracy imposed by a foreign power. Interestingly, there was indeed an ancient form of socialism qua proto-communism to be found in the society of Jesus' day. To encounter it, one need look no further than the Dead Sea sect, 
presumably the Essenes, whom Josephus describes as follows. These men are despisers of riches, nor is there anyone to be found among them who has more than another. For it is a law among them that those who come to them must let what they have be common to the whole order insomuch that among them there is no appearance of poverty or excess of riches, and so there is, as it were, equality among all the brethren. Elsewhere, Josephus notes, nor do they allow the change of garments or of shoes till they be first entirely worn to pieces or worn out by time, nor do they either buy or sell anything to one another, but every one of them gives what he has to him who wants it. Indeed, their egalitarian ideal amounted to what could well be termed Judeotopia. The Dead Sea sectarians repeatedly referred to themselves as the Evionim, the poor, likely because, as committed socialists, none of them owned anything privately. Jesus, when berated by his disciples for allowing himself to be anointed with costly fragrant oil, quibbles not with such apparent excess, but notes the simple economic reality that, quote, the poor will be with you always. In this, he is echoing Deuteronomy 15, 11, quote, for the poor shall never cease out of the land, unquote, which flatly contradicts Deuteronomy 15, 4, quote, how be it there shall be no needy among you, unquote. It is also more than plausible that he takes direct aim at the Dead Sea sect in telling a parable of an unrighteous steward who learned that his master was dismissing him. The steward then forgave the debts owed by others to his master so that they would receive him into their homes when the day came. Jesus concludes the story saying, and his master praised the unrighteous steward because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light, unquote. Luke 16, 8. In Christian circles, this saying has long been interpreted to mean that unbelievers, that is non-Christians, often act more wisely than people of faith, when Jesus' intent is most likely the exact opposite. Thanks to the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can see him with a wry sense of humor, mocking the Essene sectarians, who in multiple Qumranic passages refer to all outsiders as sons of darkness. Jesus' disciples would presumably be among them. By contrast, Jesus quips, we so-called sons of darkness or sons of this age are more wise than you sons of light as the sectarians repeatedly call themselves in the scrolls. Some interpret the parable with a broad socialist brush since the unrighteous steward is forgiving, forgiving the debt of those less well off at the expense of a wealthy master. He is Robin Hood. Jesus' next statement is perhaps even more telling. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, i.e. capital. The Dead Sea Scrolls speak frequently of the mammon of unrighteousness as emblematic of the wealth, currency, and commerce of the outside world. By cutting themselves off from material wealth, the sectarians took one more step toward complete isolation while bringing to fruition their own brand of socialist Judeotopia. Jesus, with classic sarcasm and sharp wit, charges that in refusing all commercial dealings involving unrighteous material wealth, the members of the sect, notwithstanding their obvious piety, are on the short end of wisdom. In Jesus' mind, mammon should be used shrewdly and certainly to advance self-interest. Indeed, mammon has value when it comes to living in the real world. As Benjamin Franklin observed, if you would like to know the value of money, go and try to borrow some. As far as Jesus is concerned, 
those who appropriate and employ capital shrewdly are wiser than the sons of light. On that level, as Anne Rand pointed out, in a brief moment of praise, quote, Jesus was one of the first great teachers to proclaim the basic principle of individualism, unquote. In the final analysis, there will be no end of debates about Jesus' meaning, his message, and his sympathies. Some scholars see him as a pacifistic Pharisee, aware of the rumbles of anti-Roman sentiment, yet counseling a nonviolent approach focused on what the modern left calls social justice. Others see him not as Jesus the Jewish socialist, but as Jesus the zealot patriot, an insurrectionist in his own right, in league with the equivalent of an ancient Galilean Tea Party. Interestingly, there is additional evidence in the gospel itself for the latter interpretation. Specifically, when Jesus was tried before the procurator Pontius Pilate leading up to his crucifixion, we are told that his opponents, quote, began to accuse him saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ slash Messiah, a king, unquote. The accusation is not that Jesus was a social revolutionary, but a tax revolutionary. Perhaps the most pertinent question to be asked is, WWJT, what would Jesus tax? Of course, Jesus is earlier quoted as uttering the famous expression, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. The passage may in fact represent a later interpolation emphasizing the importance of maintaining good citizenship and proving that the evolving Christian faith represented no threat to Roman hegemony. However, it might also be taken as a subtle form of sedition. For the Israelite inherently knows that if everything belongs to God, nothing belongs to Caesar. One might reconstruct Jesus as saying, as a Jew, you decide what belongs to Caesar. Who, we may ask, were Jesus' genuine opponents? Doubtless, they were the Sadducean priesthood, ever at odds with Israel's zealot patriots and ready to repeat to the authorities the incriminating rumors that had spread through the land. They knew, like the British dealing with their colonies 17 centuries later, that tyrannical taxation even to ostensibly advance the general welfare of the citizenry is the seedbed of revolt. As far as the Jewish population was concerned, neither Rome nor the Herodian state was needed to dispense charity. What belongs to Caesar? Neither taxation nor tzedakah. Indeed, nothing. As for Jesus, there is no question that he, like all observant Jews, is deeply concerned with the poor, with the underclass, with the people of the land, in Hebrew, ameh ha'aretz. Ultimately, however, his concern derives not because he is a socialist, nor a proto-Marxist, nor a radical redistributionist, but because he is, borrowing a Yiddishism, a mensch. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Hanson. Um, it's interesting. I have a couple, I have a number of questions, actually, um, before we open it up to the general Q&A. You know, my dissertation was on a significant portion of, uh, of my dissertation dealt precisely with this subject of uh, Jesus's political revolutionary um, tendencies. So what you're trying to say, what, what you're arguing right now is kind of contrary to just about everything I had uh, thought about and learned. In a no, way. no, but, but because one can make a very good case that, that he was a political revolutionary. I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I...